Greetings bass guitars, Josh Fosgreen here to teach you how to use your left hand on the bass guitar. Uh, I'm going to start with just the very basics, but then I'm going to get more into how to have really good left hand technique. Um, so this is going to be great for beginners who want to start out with good habits, and also for more advanced players who want to chiggity check their technique before they wreck their um, technique. The way this works is really simple. All, the only thing that happens with your left hand is as you move up the neck this direction, you're shortening the length of the string, which is raising the pitch, and vice versa uh, with going down the neck, lowering the pitch. So, as I go this direction, the pitch gets higher. As I go this direction, the pitch gets lower. And the way I make that happen is by just using the fingers of my left hand, and what I want to aim for is right behind the wire of the fret I want to play. So for, uh, say I want to play a C on the third fret of the A string, I would count up, this is sort of your first fret plus fret wire, second fret, third fret, so then look at the fret wire at the end of the fret, the, the end of the fret closest to the pickups, that's going to be where the note actually comes from, is that fret wire, not the one at the back of the fret closer to the nut, because it's all about what's coming into these pickups. So, uh, look at that fret wire and then just aim right behind it with your finger is a great place to shoot for. You can go a little further back, like all the way to the middle of that, that open fret area, but if you go too far back, you get that horrible sound. So if you ever want that horrible sound, then go like right, right at the beginning of the fret. But if you don't want to hear that, then end of the fret, middle of the fret is kind of what you want to shoot for. And that's pretty much it. That's seriously the basics of left hand technique for bass, is just pressing down with your fingers. And then the counterbalance to that is your left thumb. Its only job is to rest on the neck, not press on the neck. You don't want to introduce unnecessary tension, but just rest on the neck because if you didn't have your thumb there, then this would happen when you tried to fret your bass. It would get pulled behind you. So the thumb is just there so that the fingers can press down without moving the bass around. And that's all it has to do. Just keep it relaxed and let it slide around uh, with your hand as you shift. So that's the very basics. Now we're going to get into having good left hand technique and the first pointer I want to give you is to use all of your available fingers, which for most people is index, middle, ring, and pinky, which uh, with bass and guitar we number as one, two, three, four, which is different than piano finger numbers. Um, so you really want to use all four of your fingers and what this means for most people is start using your pinky because when you first start playing, it's tempting to not use it because it seems really wimpy and you might be getting like fret buzz when you use it because the muscles aren't quite strong enough to press down hard enough to avoid that buzz. So sometimes people decide oh, I'm just not gonna use my pinky and they just do this kind of three finger thing. There's a couple problems with that. One is you're losing 25% of your manpower over here in the finger department and you really want all the you know if you could get more than four fingers that would be great too because the more fingers you have available um, the easier you can go from note to note without having to do difficult shifts and stretches so it just doesn't make sense to not use your pinky and yes you get a little buzz at first and yeah maybe it hurts and it's wimpy but it will get within you know the first six months to a year if not even less time it will get as strong as the other fingers to the point where you're not thinking of it as the wimpy finger because i don't think of it that way it's it's a very equal contributor contributor to all the other larger fingers so don't be a pinky racist and uh make sure you use it the other issue with not using your pinky is that it makes you stretch unnecessarily. Like if I wanted to play an octave of say a C here, third fret of the A string and fifth fret of the G string, and I don't use my pinky, I've got to do this much of a stretch from first finger to third finger to get there, which is not that comfortable. If I switch and I use my pinky, so I'm going first finger, fourth finger to play that octave, now I've only got this much of a stretch from my from my first to third finger, and it's much more comfortable for your tendons and your hand and stuff. And this is all about economy of motion and um, using as little tension and effort as possible. So stretching when you don't need to stretch does not go under the heading of economy of motion or um, intelligently applying effort. So uh, using your pinky is a great way to actually save effort in the long run also. Next pointer is super important and it takes uh, quite a bit of practice to get comfortable with this. Using your pinky is kind of a no-brainer. This is uh, a really about efficiency and economy of motion 
and being able to play clean, especially when you start to want to play more fast technical stuff. And uh, this is sort of a two-part point. The first point is keeping your fingers close to the neck. There's a tendency when you first start playing to want to kind of like have your fingers fly all over the place. And there's nothing, you know, wrong with the fact that that's what your tendency is because why would your fingers already know how to play bass magically if you're just starting? But you really want to get in the habit of um, economy of motion and moving your fingers as little as possible to get the desired result because if you're moving your fingers more than you fingers more than you need to, chances are you're not going to be able to play as quickly or as cleanly as you want to when the moment arises. So um, one way you can practice this point is to just start on the seventh fret of the E string. Just You can start anywhere, but this is just how we're going to do it. Seventh fret of the E string with your index finger, first finger, and just play one finger per fret, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. One, two, three, four with your fingers, seven, eight, nine, ten with the fret numbers. Then cross the strings, just work your way across the neck. Then we'll just come back that same way. And what I'm paying attention to here is even when I've just got my index finger down and I'm not using any of my other fingers yet, I don't want them over here. I want them over here. Let me show you another angle of that. Don't have them out here. Keep them right next to the string. You know, there's no harm in having them ready to go. And the, the closer they are to the string, the less work they have to do to get there, which really does matter when you're talking about playing more fast technical stuff. So you can do this exercise on your own. You can kind of sh shift up the neck as you go, one fret at a time. This kind of thing. Just however you want to do it, it doesn't really matter what you do. The point is that you're using all of your fingers, all four of them, and that you are not letting them fly away from the neck uh, whimsically. You want to get in that habit. And if you have to use your other hand to kind of keep, keep them from flying away, especially when you lift up one of your fingers, uh, then go for it. I definitely did that uh, more than a few times when I was practicing this years ago. The second part of this point with finger efficiency is about keeping fingers pressed down when you're planning to do a descending fingering, like in the direction from your pinky to your index. So let's take that exercise and flip it around to illustrate this. So now I'm going to start on the 10th fret with my pinky and go down 9th fret, 8th fret, 7th fret uh, with my fingers sequentially, 4, 3, 2, 1. So what you don't want to do is go like this. See how I only have one finger pressed down at a time? And every time I press down, Every time I want to play a new note, I have to lift up the finger I'm using and press down the finger I want to use for the next note. So there's a way to basically cut the amount of work you're doing there in half, and it's to already have your fingers prepared like this. So now when I'm playing the note with my pinky, I've actually already got my other three fingers pressing down on the notes they're going to play. And the reason I do that is that then when I want to go to the next note, all I have to do is lift the finger I'm using and then I'm on the next note. So it cuts that coordination difficulty in, in half effectively, which again is super, super important when you're trying to play quicker stuff. You know, if you need to do some kind of quick descending fingering, there's just no chance you're going to get it out quick. You know, I, can't, I can sort of fake it because I'm doing it on purpose here, but if you have a habit of having your fingers fly around, and you don't have them pressed down in advance for descending fingerings, um, you're just not going to be able to keep up with your own desire to play um, complex music. You know, you can get by if you just want to play forever, but if you want to do more interesting stuff with your fingers, this is a really important point. So, to sum up with finger efficiency, keeping fingers close to the neck at all times, and with descending fingerings, keeping fingers pressed down before you actually need them. You know, even just playing a major scale, I'll do it in D. You know, I even want to do it here, just with something as simple as this. Because then when I'm going down there, and again here, then I don't have to do twice as much work for no reason. 
So this only works with descending fingerings, obviously, because if you were gonna play one, two, three, four, but you already have two, three, and four pressed down, then it's just gonna sound like the pinky note because those fingers are closer to the pickups than your index finger. So this is really a main, mainly a point for when you're moving in the pinky to index direction. So again, you can take that same exercise, just going four, three, two, one across the neck. And it gets really interesting with string crossings in the mix because you kind of have to sneak and slide stuff over to get it in it ready in advance. But I highly recommend that you take a good deal of time, you know, multiple months of practicing this on a regular basis to really get your left hand super, super efficient and it'll totally pay off. All right, don't worry, because that was sort of the most heavy duty part of this video that'll take a lot of practice to master. Um, the next couple points I have before I let you go for the day are just sort of things to keep in mind and think about. First thing is about uh, the angle you have your fingers at and what part of your finger you press down with on the neck. Now, if you're watching my fingers while I did those finger exercises, you probably noticed that I'm using my fingertips to press down on the string which uh, keeps my fingers in a fairly articulated position where they're bent, like kind of like how you would have them on piano. Not that you would play a piano that was up here. But, um, so that's the basic kind of articulated finger position for playing bass. And that's what I recommend you shoot for when you're doing finger exercises or playing scales or anything else that uses all your fingers in a fairly uh, technically demanding way. You want to aim for pretty close to your fingertips. So it doesn't have to be, you know, right on the fingertip because if you actually are pressing with like the tip of that bone, it'll probably hurt. So it's just, you know, pretty, pretty close to the fingertip, not right on the nail but not way back on the pad. And uh, that just helps keep things sounding cleaner and also it'll actually give you a slightly different tone than if you're using the pads of your fingers or using the flat of your finger doing a bar or something like that. It's a very minute tone difference, but it, uh, I do hear it when I'm listening out of a good amplifier. Um, so generally you want to shoot for your fingertips, but uh, there are times when I actually specifically don't use my fingertips, and I want to talk about that just a little bit because I don't want to just tell you always use your fingertips because that's only true in certain cases. Like if I'm like practicing uh, a Bach piece, which I want to play for you guys pretty soon, then I'll use my fingertips because I want to get a really clean tone. But there are certain situations where I would actually uh, not use my fingertips, and those tend to be bass styles where the sound isn't about being super, super clean, kind of more like funky and muted or whatever. It's not exactly genre specific, but a lot of funk bass playing uh, is when I would actually have my fingers kind of more flat versus having them really articulated like this where I'm pressing with the tips. I just have them a little flatter and kind of press with the pads of my fingers. <laughs> So there I'm not playing anything that's really demanding on the left hand. Most of that cool funky sound there is happening in my right hand, just keeping those that 16th note pulse going. So when I'm playing something where I want a sort of sloppy funky sound and I don't need to play anything anything really demanding with the left hand, then uh, sometimes I'll default to a more kind of flat finger. The benefit of that to you is that it's sort of a more relaxed hand position. So um, I'm gonna take that theme into the next point, which is about how far to stretch your hand. Uh, you might have heard the term one finger per fret, maybe from me saying it earlier in this video, um, and that's sort of uh, one of the normal stretching ranges that you'll have set up for your hand is each finger sort of gets its own fret. So if I have my index finger on the fifth fret, then my second finger would go to the sixth, third finger would go to the seventh, and fourth finger would go to the eighth fret. Just that kind of idea. And it makes sense, you got four fingers, they can each reach one fret. And it's really useful, like say again, I wanna play a D major scale. It's really great to think one finger per fret in that case because the scale encompasses a four fret span, and if I designate one finger for each fret, then I don't have to shift around a lot. Um, and, you know, those finger exercises I was showing you earlier, you just naturally do one finger per fret because you want to exercise all four of your fingers. 
The big caveat I want to add is that one finger per fret is not um, an evil draconian guideline that is enforced by Thor shooting lightning bolts at you if you don't do it. Because often, like I was saying with um, the articulated versus flat fingers thing, if I don't need to have a clean articulated sound, I'll just kind of relax my hand, which looks sort of like this. And similarly with the stretching, if I don't need to do one finger per fret, like if I'm just playing stuff in a three fret box, you know, I don't need to stretch out to four to three frets away because I'm just playing in this little in this little box. So it makes sense to relax my hand there and actually stretch it less because the more stretched you are, the more tension you're introducing to make that happen. So um, again, economy of motion and using as little effort as possible because this is all about very efficient laziness. Um, you don't want to stretch more than you need to at any given moment. So if you're just playing in a two fret span, just kind of relax your fingers to like a, you know, a little three fret box rather than a four fret box. And that's very fluid, you know, in the course of a song you might switch back and forth from a relaxed, relaxed hand position to a, to a uh, one finger per fret kind of thing. Or even more, you know, if you need to stretch out four frets high or something like that. Um, just in general, the, the principle you want to take from this, whether it's fingertips versus flat fingers or one finger per fret versus a more compressed hand position, is it's all about what works at that given moment. And I really recommend that you are able to uh, change these variables based on the situation. So, you know, obviously you want to practice your finger exercises and your scales and stuff using your fingertips, but also allow yourself to play with relaxing that when uh, you don't need to do that if you're just playing a Motown bass line or whatever. And similarly, you want to be able to do one finger per fret and, you know, work your way down the neck as you're able to stretch further and further the longer you've been playing until, you know, maybe you can do one finger per fret down low on the neck if you, if you practice stretching enough. Maybe not, because many people have smaller hands than I do. Um, so you want to work on one finger per fret as a, as a stretching thing at first, but you also want to allow yourself to uh, have your hand less stretched when it doesn't need to be stretched out and just, um, you know, be sensible and um, especially if you're getting any pain or anything like that, just go for the relaxation because bass is about having fun and not about hurting yourself because you watched some technique video and it said, oh, you have to do it a certain way. So that's that. That is all my important pointers on good left hand technique. So I hope that you will be using your pinky, keeping your fingers close to the neck, keeping your fingers prepped for descending fingerings, using your fingertips when it's appropriate, and uh, playing with stretching one finger per fret and having your hand more compressed, uh, depending on what's appropriate for what you're playing. And uh, that'll get you started on a path towards having really efficient technique, you know, um, just kind of taking those principles and applying them in different situations and being able to uh, have efficient technique at faster and faster speeds over time. It all heads in a really groovy direction. And I really recommend if you want to practice this stuff more um, to check out my finger twisters video where I've got four exercises that um, you can apply all of these principles to. Um, no matter what your level is. There's definitely a lot of room for advanced players to shed their stuff on those finger twister exercises because they're pretty brutal at faster speeds. But uh, beginners can, can check those out as well. So thank you guys for watching. I hope this has been helpful. Keep this video around for your reference. Click like, subscribe, share it with your friends. If you'd like to support me in continuing to make these bass lessons because they are a lot of work. I have to prep the lessons, I have to film them and edit them, and, and uh, you know I put many hours into each one. So if you want to help me continue to do this on a very regular basis, please check out my Patreon page, or you can make a donation through joshfoscreen.com with PayPal or Venmo. And also you can check out my book, Beastly Scales and Arpeggios, which is available on my website as well on the books page. Thank you guys for watching. I enjoy teaching these videos at you, and I'll be back at you next week. See you soon.